So like Ben said, my name is Rob and again, so I'm with Analog Devices. Uh, what we'll be talking about is just some uh, common terms, definitions, these kinds of things. Uh, the focus of this talk is going to be uh, everybody's favorite subjects, uh, grammar, uh, you know, uh, nouns, adjectives, uh, and numbers. Uh, numbers in science, numbers in mathematics. And whenever I start these kinds of talks, which are more at the um, introductory level, I always try like, to go back to see uh, what other people have done. You know, what we learned in high school or grade school that should probably everybody should have remembered. So uh, I found these great slides from the uh, University of uh, Mass, where there's a grade five teacher, Ms. Kittredge, is going over nouns, verbs, and adjectives. And you know, nouns are things, things like flowers, things like bandwidth, things like samples. Uh, adjectives are words that describe those nouns, like the bowl is red and shiny, or the Pluto has a maximum sample rate of 1 over 61,440,000 hertz. And ag again, these are just nouns and adjectives. But uh, that would be a super complicated way to say things. So we say, you know, mega samples per second, and then because we're electrical engineers, we try and uh, put it in a nice acronym so nobody can understand it except other electrical engineers. On the number side, numbers and science versus mathematics. Uh, numbers in science, this is actually a presentation that was, uh, I guess, funded by the Haystack at MIT, where they actually do a lot of outreach at the uh, high school science level, where they have numbers in science or have units. Numbers in mathematics don't have units. Uh, numbers in science always have some associated uncertainty or ambiguity. There's uh, always like significant digits. And numbers in mathematics, every number in your calculator, every number in GNU radio, every number in MATLAB, that's significant to n numbers of digits. And uh, the other kind of issue is, you know, units in science are typically driven from a measurement where numbers in mathematics are driven from concepts or ideas. Making measurements, there's always uncertainty. There's nothing is exact. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Reporting a measurement, usually when engineers and scientists report measurements, they always say what the uncertainty is. You know, it's 199 millimeters plus, plus or minus one millimeter or milliliter or uh, millimeter or how many volts things are, uh, what the ambiguity is. And significant figures are a big, big issue. So in the world of software defined radio, we have lots of mathematicians, lots of scientists, and lots of people who are bad at grammar. <laughs> and and this is, so there, there are a lot of people who like, uh, you know, think of like, um, you know, we have our software engineering, our hardware, SOC, DSP, uh, FPGA folks, and you know, communication theory is mostly mathematics. It's uh, everything is afloat, infinite precision, everything is exact, and there's no units on, on anything. You know, what are, what are the units of entropy? Uh, digital hardware, you know, everything is a fixed int. There can be weird numbers or weird formats, uh, fixed point fractionals. You can have concepts in your digital logic which are four and a half bits. Um, you know, and everything is exact because there's no error in your clock. Every, when you get a clock, that's one clock cycle. An RF hardware guys, we're the best because we just make up our units. You know, because a DB is relative to what? And nobody really knows, and uh, you know, DBMs are relative to something, exactly, but a DB is relative to something else and nobody knows why. And uh, the other issue when it comes to clocks and things is uh, we don't actually want to say how bad the hardware is, so we just leave that out. And software was everything is a buffer or a vector. And you know, each discipline feels their work is obvious and therefore leaves out the units. So it, it actually, this is a big challenge when we all try to communicate of what actually we're talking about. And when you're talking from your software colleagues or your comps theory colleagues or your FPGA implementation colleagues, this can be a big problem. So we'll just kind of like review some of these things, you know, from RF to antenna. You know, most of the things people talk about is either bandwidth or tuning range. So bandwidth is the, um, the difference between the upper and lower frequencies, and then the tuning range. So some people will define antennas as having bandwidth. I kind of prefer to think of them having tuning range. Uh, 
A lot of people think that's interchangeable. Um, but, you know, especially when antennas like this one um, has multiple bands in it or multiple tuning ranges that it's been optimized for. So this is a LTE antenna and it's optimized for 824 to 894 and from 1710 to 2170. It's hard to say what the bandwidth of this antenna is as one number, but it's easy to say what the tuning range is. And then before we talk a little bit about um, some more things on the RF side, Pre-distortion, so this, everybody should be familiar with this, this is a typical amplifier characteristics between power input and power output in DBM, so this is relative to a, a milliwatt. And as, uh, let me see if I can make the pointer come on here. As the power increases on the input side, eventually we saturate and this knee here is called the one PDB point. If we can pre-distort our signal, kind of like have this compensation, push it up the other way, then the overall signal gets to be higher power and stays in this linear region, which is what everybody wants. And from a digital comms perspective, if we have our nominal waveform and we push it through this, this curve without pre-distortion, we'll get a, uh, symbols that look like this. If we pre-distort things before and push it through that same power amplifier, then our output actually becomes ideal. And that's what the concept of, of uh, digital pre-distortion is. At the, a very high level. So there's kind of two, two approaches. The most commonly used back approach has feedback. And we use feedback, we need this five times the signal bandwidth. Because what we're really trying to do is suppress these third harmonics that are outside our signal of inter interest. So here we have a signal. We have our channel bandwidth. And so typically this is the bandwidth plus the guard band. If you want to know what the, the actual channel is, we talk about occupied bandwidth. So the difference between occupied bandwidth and channel bandwidth is the guard band. So separating out your adjacent channels. And then if you are doing DPD, oh, so sorry, if we have our air interface here, so this is the LTE standards, and they talk about channel bandwidths. Everybody talks about LTE 10, but the occupied bandwidth is only 9 megahertz because it's a lot easier to talk about LTE 15 than LTE 13.5. And then if we're doing digital pre-distortion, we talk about synthesized bandwidth. This is, this is the bandwidth that our observer path, that feedback path, and our DACs actually need to be able to handle, even though the signal that we're sending out is still in our occupied bandwidth. So when we're talking to each other and communicating these ideas and concepts, we need to make sure that we're using the right words for some of these topics. Uh, and in, including like ACLR, which is adjacent channel, like how much of my energy is being in this adjacent channel, and here is without DPD and with DPD, or the digital pre-distortion. And, and again, see here, 45 dB, that makes sense because um, it's a difference between here and here, and this is measured in the, the, between the peak and it, in the, the peak in the adjacent channel, which is a difference in dBm, which is measured in dB. So this has been mainly for um, digital communication kinds of channels, uh, for analog signals like uh, double sideband, signal sideband. We have the same kind of thing. We have our channel bandwidth. For double sideband, um, we actually split things into an upper sideband and lower sideband because we're transmitting both on the same, which is why it's so inefficient. And then single sideband, we usually just talk about the bandwidth of half of it because the uh, other half disappears. Now, in terms of the antenna, even, uh, or the receiver piece, we can have different kinds of noise. We can have total noise, um, receiver noise, ADC noise, LNA noise, and all of these things. When somebody says, my system is noisy, you, the answer is like, well, why? What is noisy in your system? It's not just, you, we can't make these general characterizations. When we talk about um, receiver specs, you know, here we have, um, the folding from ADCs. So this is typically the bandwidth that we'll talk about is uh, half of the sampling frequency. This is from Nyquist. So uh, we were talking the other night where, um, you know, Nyquist figured out this, his sampling theory when he was 35 years old. And uh, I'm way past 35 and I have not done that yet, but uh, Nyquist didn't have to worry about Xbox or Netflix. So uh, everybody's got that on their side. But 
we need to make sure that when we're doing these things, when we think of like Nyquist and sample rates, we kind of understand what's going on inside the radio as well. So if we think 30 mega samples a second coming out of the radio, well, does that mean the ADC is running at 30 mega samples a second? If it was, anything that was coming in at 15 mega samples a second would alias back into our ADC, or in our adjacent channels. And that's what Nyquist says. This is the way it would work. But what ends up happening is these filters right here are only uh, third order Butterworths inside the, the, um, the, the chips that are used in all these SDRs. So the droop that you get is not significant enough to, um, to get rid of all those aliases. So if your ADC was running at 30 mega samples, then you would see lots of signals show up from your zone two folding back. Now luckily that's not the way things work. What ends up happening is when we talk about an output data rate of 30 mega samples a second, the ADC is running at 245 because of these interpolation or decimation filters that are inside the radio or inside the FPGA, which allows the ADC to run at much, much higher, which gives us a, a first Nyquist band of 122. And even at 3 dB per decade, that analog filter is down at uh, minus 80. And it'll continue to run down past there so that as your things fold back, depending on a sensitive radio, you would probably see them. So we have um, you know, our signal running here at 30 at 245. We set our analog filters to 19, which is the other. Um, so we have a 30 mega sample channel uh, data rate. Or, uh, 30 megahertz channel bandwidth here. This is what we're capturing. We set these filters to be half of the bandwidth times 1.25 so that we don't actually get that much droop in the passband. And we set them to 19 because the people who write this portion of the documentation think of this, this is a 19 megahertz filter and this is a 19 megahertz filter, but in aggregate, it's a, uh, uh, 30 mega stamp or 30 megahertz filter from an RF bandwidth versus a uh, baseband bandwidth. So depending upon who's writing the data sheet, if it's the baseband guy, he'll talk about baseband bandwidth. If it's the RF guy, he'll talk about RF bandwidth. So when you look at uh, data sheets and documentations, you'll see things like uh, 56 megahertz. But when you program these filters, the most they go to is 28. Because one is RF bandwidth and one is baseband bandwidth. It's half. But uh, this is still, still has some issues because you know, even at minus 80 dB, or minus 80 dB of uh, suppression, you will still see these aliases coming back. Which is why you want, need to make sure we have, like we can get the same thing. We can get 30 mega samples a second here, but by adding more decimation stages or more interpolation stages, now we can actually make the DAC or the ADCs in the DAC run at like 491 mega samples a second. And we can see that this is much flatter. And we also see that these uh, knees here that were part of the noise shaping from the sigma delta have actually gone away. We've actually pushed that out because we're running the ADCs much faster. And so we still have our 30 mega, megahertz of information coming back. But we filter that to 20 megahertz because that's all we're really interested in. And then when it comes to the aliasing, now our aliases happen at 245, that's half the sample rate, and they're at a minus 140 dB of suppression. So you won't see anything aliasing back. So making sure these radios are actually set up properly is super important to your system, and you're uh, um, uh, ensuring that your signals are going to be the best they can be. So a, a basic DPD system will complicate this more where we have um, like LTE 4.5, or LTE 5 signal. So it's four and a half megahertz of occupied bandwidth, where the sample rate is 7.68. It has an interpolation filter of 5x, so that it actually goes up to 25 megahertz. And that 25 megahertz is the synthesized bandwidth here. And then the algorithm inside actually runs at this 25 megahertz, or at 38 mega samples a second even though we're really only uh, transmitting four and a half megahertz. So depending upon what you're talking about, 
what you're trying to accomplish, your data rates and bandwidth numbers can be much, much different. And here's actually just the numbers for the LTE. So we have, you know, LTE 10 has a channel, an occupied bandwidth of 9 megahertz, but a sample rate of 15.36 mega samples per second. And this is for oversampling, which we'll talk about in a second. And then, you know, that gets us to the, um, the interface between the, the transceiver device and the FPGA. So this typically runs at 2 or 4x the sample rate, depending upon what chip it is. This is pretty chip specific. So some of them are DDR, meaning that for every clock edge or for every uh, rising and falling edge, you get two data transfers. Um, and this is typically, the, the clocks are in megahertz, but the, it's a megabits per second transfer. And this would be for CMOS or LVDS. For things like JSD-204, which a couple people later will be talking about this, this uh, week, they actually have a high-speed serialized interface. So the data comes from the, high comes from the ADC, gets translated into a high-speed CERTES, and then goes into the FPGA and gets uh, deserialized. So it actually has this entire stack, which includes like an 8B, 10B encoder. And then here's actually a chart from uh, a, a data sheet that says, okay, for an 80 megahertz bandwidth signal, you have 122.88 megasamples per second, and you have a JSD line rate of 491.52 uh, megabits per second. Or sorry, 4,915 megabits per second. So the ratio between your sample rate and your line rate is uh, times 40. And where that comes from is each sample here is 16 bits. You have IQ, so that's uh, 32 bits. You have an 8B, 10B encoder, which is uh, times 40. So you have 40 bits to transfer over. So it's just sample rate times 40, and that's your lane rate. And so some of these are going quite fast, like these are going over uh, 9 gigabits per second or 12 gigabits per second to just transfer the data from the transceiver chip to the FPGA. And then there's the transport piece, like USB 2 or USB 3 or PCIe or Ethernet that goes to your host. And the transport, like for example on Pluto, is USB 2. But one of the things on, on Pluto is we have internal memory. A lot of devices will have internal memory for buffering. So we have like 128 meg of memory. So depending upon the sample rate, that's anywhere between a half a second and 61 seconds of memory you can store in the Pluto itself without actually having to stream any information over to the PC. So if you think of um, the Pluto, it takes about four seconds to transfer 128 meg across USB. Um, and USB is half duplex, so a full duplex is about half of that. So you know we get about 32 megabytes per second, which lets us stream at about uh, seven mega samples a second one way, so either transmit or receive. A USB 3 is full duplex. But you can still store, store uh, half a second of information at 61.44 and then slowly stream that out the, the device after you've captured it. And a lot of people will do that to capture a signal and then analyze it later for like the signals intelligence or for just algorithm development. Um, for USB 3 or PCIe, you know, there's other platforms which is, so you know, this has um, eight, it can have up to eight RF channels that will sample at uh, 245 mega samples a second. So you think that's from an IQ data rate, that's uh, 491.52 megabytes per second and 983 megabytes per second for each IQ channel. So times eight, and you can fill four gig in half a second. And so a lot of these things are, uh, you know, lots and lots of channels, lots and lots of bandwidth, uh, lots and lots of sample rate. It makes the communication problem or the transport problem uh, harder and harder. In terms of accurate significant digits, so this is the way, this is just the PLL inside these chips. We have a reference clock and then we have this fractional PLL. So the fractional PLL is basically has a fractional part uh, divided by some typically prime number, and then an, an integer part times that. So if our reference clock is 40 megahertz, to see what the smallest RF step we can do, 
is we just take, you know, 40 megahertz divided by 1 over this modulus number right here, and we get, you know, 4.7746 something, 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 something hertz. And that's the step increments that we can do. Uh, which is great when you have a 40 megahertz uh, oscillator, exactly 40 megahertz oscillator, because then you can get um, 2.4 gig, you end up with an integer of 60 and a fractional part of zero, and then you get a PLL of exactly 2.4000000000 megahertz. If you find you have a clock with a 39.9998898 megahertz reference clock, because your reference clocks are not going to be 100% uh, accurate. They may have a few PPM offset. You'll never actually be able to get to 2.4 because you need to have a, this, this piece in here needs to be 1,283.45, uh, which you can never get to. So fractional PLLs are not floating point PLLs. They're still integer pieces that will have step sizes. And that's why you'll see a lot of radios when you want to program them to, some, them to something won't actually be able to hit those numbers. So depending upon what you're trying to do and uh, what your reference clock is, you know, your uh, carrier offsets and your uh, more advanced DSP algorithm should be able to take care of a 4 hertz offset. And that's what kind of everybody expects. Now when it comes to sample rate, it's a little bit more complicated because we have baseband clocks which have the same kind of thing. So, you know, our baseband clock can kind of go in 19 megahertz steps, but then we can actually, the ADC clock has another divider, which we can divide from 2 to the 1 to 2 to the 6. So we can actually get like 0.299 hertz steps in the ADC clock. But the, the baseband PL clock rate has uh, bounds that it needs to hit, and the ADC clock rate has bounds that it needs to hit, so it's not always quite this, uh, this low. But you can kind of see that there's, there are integer steps, even if they're fractional numbers. And no API in the world that I know of actually um, reports these things as floating point numbers. So this, would, this one would get just reported as 2.4000002. And it may just truncate, it may round, it may do floor. It really depends on that API, um, what the API looks like. And you'll always be half a hertz off or 0.8 hertz off, or 0.2 hertz off, those kinds of things. Which for some algorithms may not be a problem, but for others maybe. So the other kind of clock thing is stability. You know, which is, there's kind of two aspects of that. One of them was accuracy, which we kind of just talked about. Then there's the drift pieces, like the aging, the drift, the temperature. But then there's also just like movement, um, like Doppler shift due to mobility. Uh, so at uh, six gigahertz, at 150 kilometers an hour, you end up with a 0.13 ppm offset just from driving. And uh, this I thought was like, oh, you know, that doesn't happen that much. But, um, you know, this is actually what happens with airplanes. So I'll be giving a talk later this afternoon about uh, ADSB, And you can actually measure this with ADSB Because the airplanes coming at you do travel 400 or 500 kilometers an hour. And uh, the frequency that they're transmitting at is 1 gigahertz. So no matter what you are doing, algorithm always needs to be able to handle this uh, half ppm offset. And the accuracy in terms of magnitude, you know, we always, a lot of us uh, in the SDR community get the question of like, okay, well, I've got exactly one dBm coming out of my uh, source over here. I run it through here. I send it to my PC. I get some numbers. How do I relate those numbers? And, you know, the answer is kind of like, uh, sounds great. Because there, there's um, relating those numbers, getting that accuracy is, uh, you know, software-defined radios are typically not sold as instrumentation. So you, you can't confuse a NIST certifiable instrument like National Instruments would make with uh, RTL SDR. They're uh, much different. So, and a lot of it has to do just with calibration. So DBM, so a DBM is an absolute number. It's a, a dB with respect to a milliwatt. A dBFS, that's a made up number by ADC manufacturers. So we'll take, uh, so this is dB is a, a log ratio with respect to a milliwatt. This is a log ratio with respect to full scale of the, of the ADC or the DAC. So we'll just take full scale and say that's zero dBFS. And anything in between is just less than that. And the more bits you have, the lower you can go.
And then there's just a ratio, which is uh, with respect to something. And uh, so what we talk about in um, our data sheets is uh, like RSSI, receive strength signal. And uh, it will be in dB, it will be linear, it will be monotonic, but one dBm of increase will not give you one dB of RSSI change. There may be a correction factor you have to apply there. And the correction factor is probably different at different LO frequencies. And so factory calibrations are necessary to limit the amount of variation. And um, so there's calibrations that you can do on all your radios, but you need to calibrate it to something else. So um, even us in our lab, we will have Plutos that have been calibrated and are actually, um, from a power input perspective, are as good as some of the instruments we have, but we use those instruments to calibrate the Plutos. And if we were to do that on every single one, then the prices would be so high, nobody would want to buy it. Um, and then, so all of these things can be done. It just takes time, and you have to calibrate them to something else. So whether it's TX power or uh, TX power versus frequency or LNA step gain or RSSI on the transmit or the receive side or even the accuracy of the clock, all of these things can be calibrated, can be corrected, but typically just nobody wants to pay for it unless you are buying something from a National Instruments or Roden Swartz or Tektronics or those kinds of things where you actually have a calibration sticker on it. The other piece is samples to symbols. So if we have these symbols coming at the right time for a single carrier system, if we sample exactly at the right place, we'll get a nice constellation. If we sample at the wrong place, we'll get not a nice constellation. And if we sample at a worse places, we get worse constellations. This is why most um, systems will oversample. This is why they'll have matched filters. This is why the digital comms guys know, like and know all the math. Um, but then, so s samples per symbol, depending upon the modulation scheme and algorithm you use, could be eight samples to one symbol or two samples to one symbol to try and correct for this timing, correct for these modulation pieces. Uh, and then we have the one symbol is how many bits out. Well, depends on the, uh, the modulation scheme you're using. And, and the error correction you're doing. So we have you know, raw bits, including overhead, versus payload bits, payload bits excluding overhead. And uh, you know, I think that kind of wraps things up. But it's you know, mathematics. So I was talking to a faculty who told me, like, you know, um, the value that the secret language engineers have to talk to each other is math. And you know, lawyers use Latin. Um, you know, physicians do the same. They make up things and then just make it a Latin word, and nobody changes it. But math is the language that uh, engineers and scientists use. But it only works when we're all clear. Like when we use units, when we have significant fingers, fi uh, when we have significant figures, and use adjectives to describe our work. It's uh, super important. So if you ever had like a uh, you know, lab report passed back to you by a faculty saying, you know, where's the units on your axis? It's the same kinds of things. So uh, thanks very much for listening. And hopefully that it, uh, helps remind people that you know, these kinds of things are important so that uh, other people can build on the work that you're doing as you communicate outwards. All right. Thanks.